All right, welcome back everyone. Here we are. Uh, this is nice. Um, I'm gonna talk about bones. I'm gonna introduce all this stuff and I already put a lecture up there on uh, the skull, the vertebrae and all that. And then I will put one more lecture about the rest of the bone. So I'm to do all the complicated stuff, bone anatomy and bone development and bone breaks, that kind of stuff. And then a leafer online just kind of going through all the bones, the humerus, the parts of the skull. So I think this actually works well for the blended, you know, because you need to argue with me about, you know, the humerus, maxillus, dactyla, you know, the basic stuff I can, I can give online nicely. But today I'll cover big bone function and how bone works and how it's remodeled, stuff like that. That's the plan. Um, current cloud, there's a, um, you should all, before lab, I sent you, I sent you an email, I'm not gonna repeat it, but make sure you, uh, you do that one on the skull. Then I'll put the one on the rest of the bones up today. So that our time in lab, either this week or next week, you guys can uh, use it to uh, study the actual bones, play around with skulls, things like that. All right, and then uh, next week, muscles, muscles and joints, and then a test. Test on bones, muscles, and joints, I think. Any questions there? I put up uh, the homework and quizzes, just pay attention. You guys should be studying on your own. You should be looking at the skin. You should have already seen my skin lecture and uh, read about skin. Good stuff, right? Tattoos and um, tans and uh, the layers of the epidermis and the dermis. Yeah, well, that's, uh, unlike most semesters, I would see you guys two, three times a week. I don't see that often, so you gotta really keep up on your own. The tests and practical, I think you all should have been what you expected. Uh, any questions on it, just let me know. You can come see me uh, before or after your lab or uh, office hours, and I can go through it if you wanna see what you missed. Um, hopefully the next one will be in person, and then I'll go over some things right after. So this is the first time I've given online now. All right, let's talk bones. Good stuff. You guys are interested in uh, bones and muscles generally, more than in unity or endocrine system. In general, students are. Yeah. So let's talk about it. We've got our skeleton here. Uh, I have lots of bones. I think I collect skulls. I got piles of bones. Uh, in lab, I bring a moose femur and I got a big draft horse femur and compared to the human. It's pretty impressive. Um, but good stuff. And uh, of course it makes up our internal skeleton. We're not a lobster with an exoskeleton, it's internal skeleton. And they say 206 bones, that's on average of course. It's an average, you know. Some of you, most of you have 24 ribs, but some of you have 25, 23. Vertebrae especially, like I have five lumbar vertebrae. You may have six, you may have four. Uh, especially little bones in the skull and in your, your wrists, uh, they vary quite a bit. Some confused, some can split. But anyway, that's the average, about 26. And you'll see, we split the whole skeleton into an axial skeleton, right down the axis of your skull, your vertebrae, your ribs, and your sternum. And then everything that hangs off of it is like an appendix of a book, the appendicular skeleton. And that's your limbs. Oh, there's a lot of them in appendicular, I guess, because we're talking about all the toe bones, all the finger bones. Yep. And think about your body weights. Take 10%, double it, it's about how much your skeleton weighs. And it, if you pick up the skeleton in the lab, it feels a lot lighter because you guys have living bone. It's filled with, it's moist, it's filled with 
fat and, and bone marrow and it's living. When you, when you dry out a skeleton, you're just left with just the shell of it, so it's much lighter. And uh, this, of course, a bone is an organ. And that was weird when we did that first lab, like, um, what's an organ of the cell system of the bone, right? But it is, because a bone is not just one kind of tissue. A bone is both bony tissue, but it also it's filled with blood and fat and uh, ligaments attached to it and connective tissue. So it is an organ with many different kinds of tissues in, with it. And I can't, I can't say it enough. Uh, it's just so easy to look at the skeleton in lab and say, that's my skeleton. But you see real bones, like butcher bones, or your bones you give your dog. Uh, they're heavy, they're wet, they're heavy, they're shiny. And uh, what we see in the lab is just the bone has been completely cleaned and dehydrated and, and bleached. And uh, that's what you get. So this is a fresh bone, right? Yeah, it's living, it's a dynamic. So the skeleton just seems like it would be like the shell of your car or something. You're just like your, your muscles uh, attached to the bones and the bones are just this non-living kind of like a robot-like interior. But they're constantly being remodeled. Blood is coursing through them. You know they got nerves in them because bone breaks hurt like hell. And to show you how dynamic they are, you guys know if you have a cast, I mean, just in a few weeks, your bone gets lighter. The density is less, besides the muscles that get in. The bone actually goes like crazy. And just looking at um, a professional tennis player or pitcher or something like that, you can look at the two humeri and see how much it is remodeled. If you guys lift weights, your skeleton is much heavier and rough with lots of tubercles and, and crests on it. And if you don't work out, your bones are smoother. And so you can sex skeletons on average, male skeletons are rougher and more bumps on them because of more muscle mass on average, of course. So yeah, real quickly, you can, uh, the bone responds. And I wonder how it responds. You know, how does it know to grow if you're right-handed? You're just like constantly using your right hand. Um, we think it's just the, uh, we don't know, but it responds. One idea is that um, there's a physics thing called the piezoelectric effect. When you push on a crystal, electricity comes off. And so it's possible the crystal matrix of your bone, when you use it, when it's being compressed, that it gives off electricity or some signals that cause more bone deposition. So your bone responds when you guys work out. If, um, and if you don't work out, your bone regresses. We'll talk later about osteoporosis, why it's so important when you're young, before age 30, to really have exercise, aerobic exercise, weight-bearing exercise, to build up your bones because it's all downhill, you know. So you want to build up the calcium in your bone early. Oh, it's a joke here. Yes, bonus chickens. So one thing, of course, you think about the function is that you know, our muscles attached to it across the joints. So yeah, what about the functions? Obviously, the first thing you think of, I think, is muscles. You know, going to cause you to move because that's our skeleton. But that's not probably the first function of bone in evolution. This was not because there's sharks just don't have any bone. Sharks are all cartilage. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, one thing, of course, it makes your shape. And forensically, you can find a, a skull. You guys have all seen it where they, they find a skull and they put the clay on it and the artist recreates what you look like. So uh, definitely the, the bones beneath us give us our shape. And we talked a lot about early on about that, how your skull is great protection for your brain, your, your rib cage, great protection for your heart and lungs. Your pelvis is uh, protecting your some reproductive organs and some things down low there. And of course, we're talking about joints in the next chapter, and we'll see how the bones work as levers and you have muscles and tendons going over that. That's how we move series of antagonistic muscles that move our joints. So the, the muscles are attached to the bone across tendons. But yeah, we think maybe the first function of bone evolutionarily was probably to store minerals. And we still use it for that. Uh, the first bone is found in uh, jaws, fishes, and they have these bony shields, which are important if a shark, ancient shark's gonna bite you. But it's a great place you can store your calcium and your phosphorus magnesium. 
And so what a great place, because you guys need calcium like crazy for muscles, for nerves, you need a bunch of calcium. So that's a way your body to store it. That's exactly what you guys do. When you guys have too much blood calcium levels, the calcium is put onto your bones and your bones grow. When you have low calcium levels, your bone is broken down and the calcium is released into your bloodstream. So every day you guys are using your bones as a store for calcium and phosphorus. It turns out uh, in adults, um, all of our blood cells are made in bone marrow. Early on, you'll see bone that uh, you make blood cells in your yolk sac and your liver and spleen, but you guys, it's all being made in your, in your bone marrow. It's red bone marrow. You guys know you think of bone marrow biopsy, you drill a piece out of your hip or something like that. What else do I got there? Oh, yeah. So, everything that you see on the bones, all the little crests and tubercles and, and bumps and knobs and little, every little groove, it all is for muscles attaching. And the holes in your skull are for, for nerves and blood vessels that go through it. But when I see this roughness here, I know that's the gluteal muscles are attaching there. Yeah, roughness back here, I know my hamstrings are attaching. So, whenever you see bumps and, uh, and, and uh, roughness on that, that's going to be so muscles can attach. And again, the more muscular you are, the bigger the bumps are because there's just more strain and more power being put in. All right. So, functions of bone. Thank you guys, got it. Oh, beautiful histology. You guys, you're going to miss it. I know. Although, we're going to look at it again. We'll look at uh, one bone slide. That's it. I swear. I can look at 10 slides. One slide. We'll look at bone again. And that's all I'm talking about today is anatomy of bone in a little more detail. But you guys got a preview in histology because we went through the basics. This is a beautiful section of brown bone. Um, yeah, and so what we're seeing here, this is the central canal. That's where the blood vessels and nerves go right down the middle. Then you see these concentric circles. See the concentric coming out? So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, well, six layers coming out. And the whole thing we call it an osteon. Any osteo is bones. And then the actual bone cells are these black um, ovals. And the bone cells are called osteocytes. Osteo is bone cytosol. And the next thing you notice are these little squiggly lines everywhere, little squiggly lines. And those are the little canals, canicula, little canals. And what happens is all the nutrients are only found in the center. And these layers out here are hard bone, solid bone. And so the only way that these osteocytes get their nutrients and their oxygen is through the little canicula they share. So this guy right close to the center gets lots of oxygen and it shares with its buddy out here because they're little, they have little extensions that touch each other. And that's how, that's how it works. So the ones on the outside of this osteon, they're far from their blood supply, man. They're like way out there in the middle of nowhere. So they count on their buddies to, to, to bring stuff to them. Ah, basic man. Well, bone slides are hard to make. Like you guys care, right? They're just provided to you. All right, but just so you guys know, um, normally we get a histology slide. We take a piece of skin, a piece of liver, and we uh, put it in wax. Let the wax solidify. Then put it in a machine with a knife that cuts it really thin. It takes a long ribbon of wax with the tissue in it. Well, bone is going to break the knife. It's too hard. And so we only have two options with bone. And one is this beautiful um, ground version. This is where you take a piece of bone and they slice it really thin with a, with a saw, and then they grind it with sandpaper, so it's super thin. So these things are like 30 bucks, these slides. Most slides are like six bucks. And then the other thing you can do is uh, decalcify it. And you get, it looks like this. So similar, but it's got a little more color maybe. And uh, what you can do is you take, you guys know you can do the experiment, you take a chicken bone, you put it in vinegar overnight, and in the morning it's all flexible, you tie it in the mouth. Same thing with bone, you can decalcify it with acid, and then you can slice it, it gets really, it gets really like uh, rubbery, you can slice it. So here's a view of decalcify. All right, so two kinds of bone slides, either the ground or the decalcify. It's the same thing, it's two different ways to make. All right, let's talk bones, big picture. This sounds like a multiple choice question, doesn't it, here? We're gonna give you a kind of bone and ask you, is it a long bone or short bone? 
So pretty straightforward. Long bones are longer than they are wide. So your femur, your humerus, your radius, your ulna. Here's the ends are kind of expanded. Short bones are about the same, they're like cube shaped, about the same length and width. And these pretty much are just your wrist and ankle bones. And they include another kind of bone. You need to know what a sesamoid bone is. An sesamoid bone is a bone that forms in a tendon uh, kind of differently. So it forms separately in a tendon. And the most famous is your patella or your kneecap. So it is a short bone and it's also a sesamoid bone. You've got some others that form in the tendon underneath your big toe. Sometimes they got one that forms in your, in your, in your wrist. So they're bones that form in tendons. They're places where the tendon wants to like, change direction or need some strength. So think about your kneecap. It's taking all that force from your quads and it's bringing it down to your tibia. And so that bone is going to protect and help direct the power. And flat bones are flat, obviously. Examples would be your skull bones, even your ribs, your sternum, your scapula, they're flat. And a regular or weird shape. So a good example is your vertebrae, and then some of your facial bones are irregularly shaped. All right, so we can put them all into these categories. And long bones even include the bones in your fingers. They're not that long, but they're still elongated. Your teeth, oh my god. I don't think your teeth are bones, your teeth are teeth. <laughs> yeah. I would say a regular kind of guess, but I think teeth are teeth. They're made a little bit different. We're talking a lot about teeth. Teeth are the hardest substance in your body. They're harder than bone. All right, basic bone anatomy. Uh, just some terms, you know. Uh, so you look at, this is a humerus up here, an arm bone. And uh, we call the shaft of it the diaphysis. Diaphysis. And then when it comes to the two ends, it's the metaphysis, it's like middle. And finally, the very ends are the epiphysis. So epi, like on top. So your epiphysis are the two ends of the bones. And when we talk about you know, your limb bones, we talk about the proximal and the distal epiphysis. All right, proximal towards your body, distal away. Yeah, so diaphysis is the shaft, epiphysis are the ends. I don't use metaphysis, the other one too much, but it's kind of in between. Now we're going to see, very cool, when you look at the ends of the bones, there's a line. There's a line there. And in many of you, several of you, it's still going to be cartilage if you're still growing, taller. Um, but that fuses in me, it's just a line. And that's where the point where the bone grew longer, that the epiphysial line. Bones are surrounded by this really tough saran wrap called the periosteum. So it's a sheet, it has lots of nerves and lots of blood vessels underneath it. So again, you break a bone, you feel it, and it bleeds a lot, doesn't it? it shows you how bones are living. And there's two kites of bone. They're both made of the same osteocytes, but compact bone is solid. And then spongy bone is more open and airy. And you'll see, looking at this, <clears throat> the compact bone makes up the, the shaft of the diaphysis. And you see that spongy bone up at the epiphysis, right? Now, you don't want your whole bone to be made out of compact bone. It'd be too heavy. So that spongy bone is still strong, but uh, um, it's lighter. What else we got here? Oh, and at the ends of the bone, see this bluish stuff? That's your uh, it's hyaline cartilage. We call it the articular cartilage. Where two bones come together is where they articulate. So it's slippery, uh, wet, and uh, cushy at the ends. Remember, arthritis is when you wear it away. In the middle is the medullary cavity or the bone marrow. The bone marrow fills the inside of bones. I think it looks like I've run out of room. The last one here is that all bones have blood vessels, like a wind vessel, called the nutrient artery. Uh, vessels, uh, arteries go in, veins go out. Oh, hell yeah. So the whole bone is vascular. It's tons of blood. All those cells are hungry for nutrients. And the bone marrow, you're making your blood cells. So pouring out of the bones are brand new red blood cells and white blood cells. So lots of blood supply. And so if you look at any bone or real bone, you'll see little holes. That's where the arteries went in.
we got some spongy bone. Cool. And those are you interested in like biomechanics and, and uh, uh, yeah, like how, how looking at athletic endeavors and how the physics of it all, when you look at the, these little trabeculae, these little lines, they line up with the forces. So if you look at physics, the forces, it's, so it's really, your bone is remodeled for the forces that you are giving it. And, um, and so it's, it's pretty cool when you study that. Now, if you were a rookie radiologist and you look at this x-ray, you'd be like, oh my God, they broke every bone in their body. <laughs> There's a hairline fracture everywhere. All these little lines? No, 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 that's okay. What well, you look at it as a child. And so um, we're gonna talk about how bone develops and grows. And these are the epiphyseal lines. They're made out of cartilage until, you know, you're, whenever you're done growing. Yes, look at that. All those little lines are cartilage. This is obviously an adolescent. This is again a skull bone. You guys can see this in lab, but you see the compact bone and it's sandwiched in between is some spongy bone. There'll be, in the spongy bone, there'll be bone marrow making blood cells. Beautiful. All right, probably enough pictures, but to get the idea, the compact bone is the solid and then the spongy bone is in there. All right. So this periosteum, wicked strong. You can kind of pull it off a bone. It goes like, it like pulls off, but it's really tightly attached. And it's all over the bone, except at the cartilage at the end. So it stops right at the cartilage. This is the whole of the cartilage. And then I want to mention, when we'll I talk about tendons later, the muscles, is that the, the tendon of a muscle, your biceps or whatever muscle, it doesn't just like stop at the periosteum. It's not being pretty weak. The, the fibers of it actually go into the bone. See that picture? Those fibers go into the bone, so it's a wicked strong connection. So if not, when I have really forcefully contracted, I might rip off the periosteum, rip off the muscle, burst the tendon. But no, the fibers go deep within the, the structure of the bone, so it's really nice and strong. <clears throat> And underneath the periosteum, the, uh, the codeine on your bones are stem cells. So uh, if you break a bone, the periosteum is ripped, it wakes up those stem cells and they start laying down bone. And nerves, blood vessels. And then what lines the inside of the bone is the endosteum. See, these terms make sense. Periosteum is the perimeter and the outside. Endosteum lines every little bar, every little nook and cranny on the inside. It's just another thin layer of connective tissue. And again, stem cells on either end, so that the bone is broken, they're ready to wake up and make more bone. All right, bone marrow. <clears throat> the inside of the moist living part of a freshly broken bone, if you look in there. You open it, look at it, bone marrow, it's going to be yellow or reddish and wet and bloody. And so early on, before you even have bones, bones start developing this little bit before birth, and you're getting all out of cartilage and a little fetus. Your blood cells are made elsewhere, but as an adult, your blood cells are made in the red bone marrow. And it's red in color, and it's very bloody. Lots of fat in there, too. And we have a lot of it, and you can see the picture up there where you have it. So you don't have that in all your bones, because you don't need every bone to make blood cells. You don't need that many. But especially when we want to get some, think about the hip, right? Take some out of the hip or the sternum right in front. You can get like a big, huge needle and just get into this because the sternum is right under your skin. You get less bone marrow, but you get some right there. And the proximal parts of your femur, your skull bone, your vertebrae has a lot of, a lot of it. The red marrow is in like a spongy bone. And it's, uh, if you can see it under a microscope, it'd be tons of stem cells making blood cells. Here's a beautiful histological slide. All the dark purple is the bone. And then all the rest of it is fat. And, um, and we call it hemopoietic or hematopoietic tissue. It means it makes blood cells. So in this case, it's stained purple. I understand it was red, it's just a stain. And so these are the stem cells. And this would be in your bone marrow, all these little stem cells. They're listening. And if you guys moved to Denver, 
they're like, oh shit, there's no oxygen up here. We need more red blood cells and it will like really stimulate them. Or if you guys get sick, a certain ones of those will start making neutrophils or, or, or eosinophils. So the bone marrow of these stem cells are just waiting for the signal. What do we need, Jeff? We'll make more of those blood cells for you. And you all know disease like leukemia, you get cancer, they can sometimes irradiate all your bone marrow and replace it because the cells are abnormal. So, and then you see lots of adipose tissue. You guys know it, that fat, that chicken wire. So lots of fat in it. Look at a fresh bone. You can see that little yellow, that's fat. And over here, all this red is making blood cells. Yeah, and so I did this. It got in a bone marrow registry to see if someone needs it. Usually it's a close relative. You can give them the bone marrow. But these stem cells in your bone marrow, of course, so important because they make all your blood cells. And if you have a cancer of those cells, you're not making enough immune cells. You can get sick from almost anything. So they can um, kill off all the cancerous ones, irradiate them, and then give you a donor cells if you want to hope that they take. Yeah, the bone marrow, the red bone marrow. Oh, I, everything comes back to food with me. Um, bone marrow is delicious. My, my stepdad is from Austria and they would eat, we get rye bread and we roast bones and then it's really fatty. You put that for your dog, but it tastes like, um, like beef and like mm. butter or kind of like that. Oh yeah, yeah, this is a, uh, what's that restaurant? The Lost Kitchen, has anyone heard of that? Is it freedom name? Nobody. All right. It's really exclusive. It's the most money I've ever spent on a meal. But you go there and she makes everything. Aaron French is this cook makes everything. And it only opens uh, certain days. And uh, you have to send in, Lindsay made these water cards, these little postcards. You send a postcard and they choose people who are going to eat there. <laughs> so anyway, this was a, a bone marrow butter that was right here. Like this. Bone marrow. It's got lots of fat, very. A lot of people used to eat bone marrow here in America. You can still get it at market baskets, you buy it all in the grocery store. So. Or when you make pho, when you make a, um, uh, you know what I'm talking about. When you make a, like Thai, Thai soup. You know, okay. Anyway, bone marrow has a lot of the gelatinous part of it. So, what makes a bone? All right, so uh, the hard part of bone. Bones, you know, you're gonna hit it on the table, you're gonna be solid. Um, the bones have to be, I told you this, they've got to be not only hard, crystal solid, they have to be able to resist um, compression, they have to be flexible. Because remember that disease, osteogenesis imperfecta? If you don't make the collagen right, your bones are brittle and they break all the time. So there's this beautiful symphony where you, you make both of them just the proper proportions. Turns out by weight, it's 70%, 30%. Is the right mixture in order to have bones that are, are strong enough yet flexible. So you guys can see the difference between those. If you don't have enough calcium in your diet or vitamin D, your bones become too flexible, they bend. If you have a disease where you don't make enough collagen, your bones are brittle and they break all the time. So when we make bone, we lay down collagen in this little matrix, then we put this salt in there, this crystal, and then we have just the right mixture. It's called hydroxyapatite. That's the main uh, chemical that makes up our bones. It has calcium, it's a calcium phosphorus salt. So it has calcium and phosphorus in it. You don't have to know the carbon or anything like that, but yeah, this is what makes our bones. And we have other things. Bones also hold some magnesium. They can hold heavy metals like arsenic and aluminum too. That's not good, but um, that's the, 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 the inorganic crystalline part of our bones. But don't forget the collagen. You start out with the collagen, you need that flexibility. Yeah. All right, hydroxyapatite. It's calcium phosphorus salt. So we looked at the beginning, like what makes up our body the different elements. The calcium and phosphorus are up there because we have lots of it in our bone. All right. We'll go a little, another five minutes. All right, let's look at the, the anatomy of the bone. I've already kind of given you a preview of it, right? But here's a view of decalcified bones. You see those circles, all those circles, like concentric circles. The big white holes are the central canal, the big white holes. That's where the blood vessels and nerves are coming at out of the screen. 
And then these concentric circles are going to hold the, the bone cells. Yeah. And it's always being remodeled. I'm going to blow your guys' mind and tell you that all of your skeleton is like completely recycled. Um, let's see, you know, at least every decade. If you think, oh, I got my bones, I'm going to use them all my life. Well, they're constantly remodeled. All that calcium and phosphorus gets um, reabsorbed and you make new. So you're always making new bones. We can, we can figure this out. Yeah. And of course, they remodel when you guys start a new exercise regimen or you end up being way up on the couch, your bones will be will remodeled too. All right. So again, I've already given this to you a little bit, so it should be uh, just, you know, I won't spend too much time here. But this whole thing, the whole structure is called an osteon. And these are the lamellae. Lamellae are the layers. And the layers, that's all this white in here is going to be hard crystalline hydroxide apatite and collagen fibers. So the matrix is solid because it's a bone. Solid. And the cells, the osteocytes, are trapped in the little lacunae. The lacunae are the little caves. They actually trap themselves. This used to be a, a, a osteoblast, used to be a cell, and it made the matrix around it and it trapped itself. So it trapped itself. And now it's in this little cave. But luckily it has, it left space for its little fingers that come out. It's like an octopus, it has all these little extensions. And they come out and the little fingertips touch their body, like closer to the central canal, their body further away. So these little caniculi are touching their neighbors forward and towards the center and toward the outside, and that's where they're going to share nutrients, oxygen, and yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'm looking at a bone cell here. I see it has little, little fingers that come out. They're going to talk to their buddies like that. What else do you need to know? I've talked about those terms. The cune is the cave, osteocyte is the bone, and have an artery, vein, and nerve come in. So bones, when they break, you feel it, it bleeds like crazy. Let's see. Uh, these cross connections are called per, uh, perforating canals. Let's see. They're perforating canals. When they, when they talk to each other crosswise, so you'll see that, perforating. And then, but up and down, they're running in those central canals. You see the blood vessels. I hope you guys can picture this. I hope you can picture that. See these little osteocytes? They had their little canals, they're touching their buddies further away and closer to the blood supply. That's what they do. And they live there, they don't do much when they're just inactive, but eventually the bone is constantly remodeled. It's getting broken down and rebuilt constantly. This shows the periosteum, that layer on the outside. And it shows in here the spongy bone. So this nice uh, osteon system, these concentric circles, it kind of you don't have room for it in the spongy bone. So it has room to make it in the compact bone, but in here you just end up with kind of just like rings. But normally this osteon is this beautiful concentric lamellae and circles. Another view, guys. Let's get the definitions down. Used to be called perversion, we call them osteons now. But it shows a beautiful little caniculi. All right, like I said, bones are bloody, filled with nerves, and uh, indeed, you have holes in bones, and in life, arteries and veins came in and out. All right. Uh, again, just showing you that. Um, in the in the spongy bone, you can't really have room to make those nice concentric circles, but you just have kind of like rows. So, bone in both spongy and compact bone is the same cells. It's just they don't have room in the little spongy bit to spread out. Beautiful, showing some uh, spongy bone. That's all bone marrow, all those little things. All right, I've been talking now 35 minutes, 36 minutes, so we definitely need a break. We'll take a, uh, um, a four minute break, so 8.39. Any questions all so far? I guess I've just gone through the anatomy of it. All right, we'll continue.
You guys are quiet. All right, you guys, you can see this. Um, I'm just reminded, when you guys are babies, and fetus, babies even, uh, you're, you're mostly carnivores. So babies are bendy, no bendy, he's like a shark. Uh, um, and then uh, one thing you can do, one technique is called clearing and staining, which is awesome. So you take a whole specimen. You want to see the bones and the, and the muscles. Well, for me, if I want to see the bones, I got to, in the, by the anatomy lab, if you guys want to see it, I'll show you. I got a tank of these beetles. But right now, eating the flesh off a coyote skull. And you end up with this solid skull and you clean it, it looks nice. Another technique with small specimens is that you can digest away all of the, uh, the tissue. And then it leaves you with uh, just the bone and cartilage. And you stain the bone and cartilage like this pink and this blue. And you get these beautiful cleared and stained or diaphanized uh, specimens. And when I got my PhD, a lot of my my friends, they were looking at bone development and how different bones develop in frogs and birds. But um, they would do this. They would make a whole series of tadpoles and they would kill them like every week and they would clear and stain them. You could describe the maxilla, the frontal bone, and how they develop, which the timing and everything. So 
Anyway, it stains blue and uh, pink like this, and you can do whole specimens. It's pretty cool. All right. Yeah. All right. So we talked about that nice bone structure with those concentric circles, those glossy eyes. True. But you set down bone like when it breaks. You don't have time to do all this stuff. You just set down quick and dirty bone called woven bone, immature bone. And I'll show you a picture. It's not, it's kind of disorganized, but it's solid. It's, it's solid, but it's just. Uh, not as strong and just kind of put down. That's the way that we uh, we start making bone. And uh, in our two sockets, you get a tooth pulled, and then uh, the bone fills in that socket. It fills in really quickly with this woven bone. When you break your bones, you put down this woven bone. So it's just the first step. Like you throw it down quick, like a patch in your driveway. Just throw like the quick concrete, and then the professionals will come and see that. You can see clearly that this is, it's got more cells per, the density of cells is higher, and it's just not organized. Oh, this is an awesome picture. I want you guys to look at this and appreciate this. We see, as you see these osteons, this one, this one, but you see this little region, like this little rainbow? That was, there used to be an osteon here. So you see like the remnants in the past, how this bone has been remodeled. It's been broken down and reformed. So I really want to get that in your heads, is that your bone is not static. It's always being remodeled. For some reason, you're always tearing it down and building it up again. I guess it allows you to adjust to whatever stress is there. All right, so what I want to hit today in lecture is uh, bone development, how bones develop. And uh, you can see that you guys are all cartilage. When you're a fetus, you're cartilage. There's no bone at all. And then you can see just before birth, you start, the bone starts forming. And so babies are really uh, bendy and flexible. Uh, there's not a lot of bone there. You can see there's 300 bones at birth. How the hell can you do that? How can you go from 300 to 206? Because a lot of the bones are in pieces and then they'll fuse together. And uh, yeah, you in this room, if I were to look at your x-ray of your sacrum, almost all of you, the bones wouldn't be fused yet. Definitely not your xiphoid process. So bones fuse later in life. I talked about cartilage turns into bone. When you get older, you get more creaky and ribs break easily. So it's true. You guys, the development of cartilage to bone varies upon different parts of your body. All right, and so we'll see the two kinds of ways you make bone. I put them in red. Endochondral is the most common. That's where you have a cartilage model. But then I'll talk about intermembranous where bone forms to come out. All right, first, who's this cast of characters? So who's are the cells in bone? And you've got some stem cells here, but let's move right to the osteoblast. So osteoblast builds bone. Blast is, uh, is gonna make the bone. So these cells secrete collagen, secrete crystals, and they make the bone. Once they make the bone around them, they're trapped. They're trapped in this little thing that we make. And then we call them osteocytes. Osteocytes are the bone cells just sitting there trapped in the matrix. But the blasts are what build it and they turn into those. Now a completely different kind of cell is the osteoclast. Did you see? That breaks down bone. So osteoclast, we're gonna break it down. And these uh, are actually made from white blood cells. They're completely different. And, uh, they, their job is to break down bone. They've got all these enzymes and acids that will eat away at the bone. Yeah, they remind me of this old commercial, these old scrubbing bubbles. They've got this little ruffled border and they move over the bone, like really slowly, and they eat away at the bone. And so as they dissolve the bone tissue, the calcium and phosphorus are released into the bloodstream. So when you guys have low blood calcium, osteoclasts, they get excited because of a hormone, and then they start eating away at the bone, and then your calcium levels in your blood will go up because you've taken it out of the bone and into your blood. And if you have too much calcium in your blood, osteoblasts start laying it down in the bone. All right? Blast build, clast. What's a good way to remember that? Like, I don't have anything. Cuts away at the bone. So, 
All right, so you can see on here, these little osteoblasts, they're all cool. Hey, let's make some bone today. Woo! They're gonna lay down, they lay down the collagen, then lay down the salts, then they end up being trapped in this matrix. Like, oh, damn, I'm completely surrounded by my matrix. And then they're called osteocytes. And they're, they just, they're a lot less active. And here's some blasts, team old cells. They're, uh, they're big and then several nuclei, and they just eat away at the bone. Yeah. I don't want to confuse you, but next semester we do, we do the hormones. You see that parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. There's two hormones that are going to excite the osteoclast or the blast. And you guys have it kind of equal. So it's pretty cool. Your skeleton maybe even building up a little bit. But as you get older, all of a sudden the class are a little more active than the blasts. And you start overall getting a less dense skeleton, the osteoporosis can set it. So there's this beautiful balance of bone building and breaking down. You see, you get older, especially women, they really break down the bone more than they build it. It's a slow process. You end up with a weaker bone. Put that up there. All right, two ways to make bone. The unusual way is between two membranes. And you simply lay down some membranes and then uh, bony cells go in there, they make the bone, and it's called intramembranous between some membranes. And these are some flat bones in your skull, your clavicle is your sternum. Yeah, that's it. So the bones in your skull and your sternum and clavicle, but all the rest of your bones are done the other way. And it's called endochondral. So chondral means cartilage. So all the rest of your bones, your, your femur, your tibia, your, your vertebrae, your finger bones, your arm bones, your leg bones, they're all made by making a cartilage model. It's like if you're going to make a bronze statue. You make it out of wax first, then you turn it into the metal. So this is you make the whole bone out of cartilage, out of cartilage, and then you turn it into bone. And uh, that's what we do. We make a simple model of cartilage first. And then we destroy the cartilage. Actually, we leave it at the ends. The cartilage is left at the end, right? The, the rest of it is turned to bone. Yeah. This is an absolutely gorgeous picture up here. Um, the red is bone, and this is cartilage. So you see that line right there? That's that epiphyseal line. Oh. So I'll show you this. Um, kind of draw one. I think I have some nice pictures here. What happens is you get a model out of cartilage. That's what you start with, this model. So let's say it's your femur, your leg bone. You got this femur completely made out of cartilage. And then it goes through this ossification and turn into bone. And the first thing that happens is in the middle, a collar of bone forms in the middle. So the collar of bone forms, and that cartilage in the inside of it starts dying. It starts dying, and then it's replaced by bone cells that come into the blood. And so that's the beginning. Start out with simply cartilage, you make this bony collar in the center. Oh, I like this, yeah. So you guys, can you, can you picture this? Look at the very top. When it's all blue, it's all cartilage. But you see that collar forms first. You see all the blood vessels? That's called the primary ossification center, the collar. And then at the ends, you can see number six at the very top. And number seven, you have a secondary ossification site at the epiphysis. So then all of a sudden, the middle of the ends start ossifying from the middle. And then what happens, this will last for years. We have just stage where you have a line of cartilage here. That's that epiphyseal plate. And the, it will continue as long as you guys are growing taller. And then eventually it will just ossify. You're done growing taller. So basically, primary ossification site is a collar around the middle of the bone. And then you have secondary sites at the ends. And it leaves a little bit of cartilage at the ends of the bones. And then along a line, this epiphyseal line. And that line is where the bones continue to grow longer. All right, that's the basics. So this is what I showed you earlier when you look at these x-rays of people before they're done growing. You see these lines. That's cartilage. So in an x-ray, it shows up darker. In these epiphyseal plates, I remember I sprained my ankle, they're a little worried when, when you're still growing. If you damage that epiphyseal plate, um, you can end up like 
not growing any taller on that bone, or it can grow abnormally. So if you're adolescent and you actually separate at the efficacy of plate, they worry about it, they can really follow it to make sure that your bone develops normally. This is a repeating what I just did, just another, another view. You can see it starts in the middle. Yeah. And then you end up, the ends are made out of cartilage. But then all of a sudden bone starts forming in those ends. And it takes over, except you leave it at the ends, the articular cartilage. And you leave that plate of cartilage. And that will last when you guys are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I'll, that'll continue until you guys are done growing. And then it will fuse. Yeah, pretty cool how that's the way. And then once you're done growing, like height wise, the bone can still get thicker by adding more on the outside. You can always shave away from the inside. So you can change the bone, but when it grows longer, it's always at this efficacy of plate. And we can look a little more carefully. There's actually four zones in this cartilage that we can look at. If you look at the cartilage, this is hyaline cartilage. See all the cells are dividing. It looks more normal up here. And so the four layers, the book describes it nicely, but you got a layer where this, the cartilage is kind of resting, not doing much. And then this proliferating layer is where it's going through mitosis, dividing like crazy. So it's dividing and dividing. And if you look at the cells, they're small. But then the next layer is the hypertrophy, where they grow big. And that's where you're really gonna grow taller. So the cartilage is a resting layer, then a layer where they're dividing like crazy, proliferating. And then what's interesting is where they get bigger, and then they push the bone longer, they, they hypertrophy, they get bigger. And then once they get bigger, there's a layer where that cartilage is then destroyed and turned into bone. So yeah, it's weird, huh? You guys have this plate of cartilage, the ends of your bones, it's growing throughout your puberty, Years uh, earlier than that, and up to puberty, and this cartilage eventually is going to get overtaken by the bone, and the bone is going to finally kill off all the cartilage, and then you're, you're going to be hit your maximum height. Yeah, what hormone do you think is going to really influence the cartilage? It's probably going to be growth hormone, growth hormone for pituitary. And then sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone. Which do you think has a more powerful effect? Estrogen or testosterone? A lot going on here. Do men or women grow taller and faster, like earlier in life? Oh, back in grade school, were there girl taller or boy taller? Girls, yeah. Um, estrogen has, a, has more of an effect, uh, and so often, the, the boys in the in class are really young. They, they, they're shorter, and then they, they catch up. And they, they tend to overtake on average. All right. So your bone is constantly remodeled. Oh, my God. How many times have I said that? I said like 10 times now. You guys got it always remodeled. And it's always the osteoblast building, osteoclast breaking down. That's what I'm talking about here. 10 to 20% of your skeleton is replaced each year, right? So by 10 years, everything has been replaced. So you think, you think you know the calcium in your finger bone, but don't get attached because on average in 10 years, it's gonna be different calcium. So you're always building, breaking it down and making new. And I showed you that histological section. You can see like the old osteons and the new osteons. So you always remodel. Your body is, is uh, always wants to replace it with new, yeah, I always thought the skeleton, like once you had a skeleton, it was just there for the rest of your life, but it's always being remodeled. All right, so things you need obviously are calcium, right? You need enough, you need, you drink, you need enough milk and cheese in your life, right? And then y'all need vitamin D, the strong bones and teeth. So vitamin D is going to allow you to absorb calcium in your gut. We'll talk more about that. Oh, we talked about you need some sunshine to make vitamin D. Uh, vitamin A is also very important uh, to, to normal bone growth. Uh, vitamin C, we'll talk about that. Vitamin C, you need to make collagen. You guys know the disease you get if you don't get enough vitamin C? The pirates used to get it out of the teeth. Scurvy, yes. You get scurvy and then your, your teeth fall out. Your teeth are held in by collagen, so you need your hands, skin with that. 
Um, you can't make normal blood without vitamin C because they make the collagen. And then uh, vitamin D is going to allow you to have enough calcium. You need enough calcium in your diet for sure. Um, growth hormone, if you have too much, you get giganticism. And uh, that epimysial plate will grow like crazy, like too fast. And you get too tall. And uh, if you don't have enough, you have dwarfism. Dwarfism from a lack of growth hormone or hypopituitary dwarfism. Normal proportions just don't grow very tall. So clearly growth hormone is important to uh, growth of these bones. Thyroid hormone, that's also necessary for normal metabolism and your nervous system and bones too. And then again, sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone. We're going to see it's important for osteoporosis, it's important for bone growth, it's going to stimulate bones like the epithelial plate, but also puberty, like rushes of hormones, also make it ossify and you, and you stop growing. But sex hormones, growth hormone, vitamins, and then you guys you encourage bone growth by exercising, but, yeah, especially um, impact uh, swimming, not as much as like running on a treadmill or something. So the more the bones are stressed, uh, the more uh, they will grow. Yeah, here's an example of, we'll talk about this with hormones, but you have giganticism, like Andre the Giant, Princess Bride, he was a big wrestler, and uh, you end up just, not only do your bones grow really tall, but then you get other soft tissue grows uh, too. All right, let's talk bone breaks. Ooh, how many in a year have broken a bone? Just get a here. What do you guys think it is? Like, like about 30, 40% of us? All right, yeah, yeah. Um, it hurts. Actually, it's pretty nice. Um, but um, breaking the bone, you know that it heals really nicely. So cartilage, ligament damage, damn, that doesn't heal very well. It takes a long time. Bone, I mean, yeah. depends on upper or lower limb, depends how young you are, but. Once that heals, like my, my tibia and fibula, I don't think you could tell where it was broken. I guess it was broken. Four years, four years ago, but it's been a while, but you completely remodel it because you're always remodeling it. So it just heals so nicely, bones. Not in the elderly. I mean, if you break a hip or something, oh God, you gotta be mobile or break a femur. Oh, um, a lot of bones uh, can be healed enough pretty quickly. All right, some basic terminology. Um, when you hear a compound fracture, I don't like that terminology, but that means it's broken through the skin. Yeah, never good because that infection can get in there. Um, oh, here's, a, here's a picture to show you. Yeah, so um, it can break in a spiral fashion. It can break, uh, it can be a hairline fracture. It can be uh, oblique at an angle, uh, comminuted, comminuted in many pieces. And then you got to put them together. You guys know the basics of that. If you break a bone, the most important thing is to put those bones together. So wear a cast, maybe put some pins in it, you know, weights, whatever you need. Put the bone together, you're cool. You look at some of the old like skeletal museums before they did that, you see these weird broken bones that healed just so strangely, you know. Today we know, oh, we got air casts, all kinds of casts, and we, we know how to put them together. And we have things like metal rods. But a compound fracture, no bueno. If you see the bone sticking out of your arm, out of your skin, you know there's an issue. And uh, you know that you can have duct bacteria getting in there. And that. All right, so basics, I think you guys know this. You guys are interested in athletic injuries, a lot of you, these broken bones, a lot of you. Um, what's gonna happen, first thing, the bone breaks, is you're gonna feel pain. It's gonna be pain in blood. Um, blood inside, it's gonna form a hematoma there because it's gonna bleed, because there's lots of blood vessels. That periosteum is going to be ripped, and so it's going to stimulate those stem cells to just begin the healing right away. But first thing is a hematoma. It's going to bleed like crazy, and then it's going to this clotting mesh that we'll talk about in blood. It's going to kind of stop the bleeding, and then white blood cells will come in to eat the debris and start cleaning up. So it's going to feel warm, painful, swollen as soon as you break a bone, right? And what your body does is it puts on a callus, like the soft callus is a, like a, a cartilage, kind of a um, the first step in the fixing your bone. And then that cartilage is going to turn into that woven bone. And then over time, you're going to remodel it. So you see a soft callus, 
then that callus will become ossified, stronger made onto bone. And then you spend most of the time remodeling it, making it good again. I'll show you some pictures. Oh yeah, this is nice too. All right, got the basics. Hematoma, it's gonna bleed. You're gonna have tons of white blood cells to clean up the mess. It's gonna be painful and swollen. And then you sit down a, a, a callus made out of this uh, fibrocartilage, not a cartilage. And then a hard callus is when you're gonna just lay down bone quickly. That woven bone, just lay the blade freak down. Lay down so it's gonna kind of like give you some strength. And then the remodeling phase, if you look at the timeline, that takes the most time. Your body will like overreact to make a big thick callus. Then it will start shaving it down, making that osteon system and making it strong. So you may be out of the cast here, but your body is still remodeling it to make it as good as normal. Uh, this will show uh, the callus formation here in your, your fibula. You see this? So at this stage, look at a couple weeks out from the break, you can see that your body has laid down this callus. All right, one thing that's confusing to people is that grandma and grandpa broke their hip. They did not break their hip. They uh, broke the neck of their femur, really. I mean, you can break your hip. It's a little harder to do. But we're talking mainly about right here. And so we'll talk about osteoporosis here in a minute, the weakening of the bone. It weakens the most in spongy bone. Spongy bone weakens the most because they're the most surface area. And there's class to break it down. So spongy bone breaks down a lot quicker. You have a lot of spongy bone here. Look at the picture of the end of the bones. So that's what really weakens. And with a fall, a broken hip is usually the, the neck of the femur breaks. It sucks because you're old, so you don't heal very well. You're really immobile if you're that if you're elderly already, if you use the open. Use the yeah, so let's talk osteoporosis. Well, osteopenia is like weakening osteoporosis is serious porous bone, right? Osteoporosis, porous bone. And uh, you're going to see how common a disease this is. Um, yeah, I'll talk about it. But what happens is that your bones get weaker and weaker, and there's no symptoms. If you guys have osteoporosis, it's not like you have an elevated temperature or you can see it. It's your bones are weaker. The first symptom is going to be when grandma just has a simple fall and breaks a bone. Then they look and they say, oh, okay. I mean, they can do bone density scans. They're doing those more and more to kind of pick it up. But mainly it's at that point, if you're elderly and you have a low bone density, there's not a lot you can do. There's no quick fix. Um, there are some drugs out there that are looking at increasing bone density, but um, it happens to the elderly, especially women. So you can see, you get shorter as you get older, definitely. You lose your vertebrae, they collapse because your vertebrae are mostly spongy bone too. So they're the ones that collapse. You can say it's broken, but it doesn't, it just collapses really. And so look at how porous this is. Oh, it's so weak compared to the stronger bone. And luckily, as elderly, you're not probably playing football, you know, things like that. So you're less active, so it's okay. But if it gets so porous, it's gonna break if the hip breaks or you know, wrist, something like that. Elderly, it's a big deal. Yeah, so osteoporosis, no symptoms. Nothing. The first sign is a broken bone from a simple fall that should not have broken the bone. And again, you guys got the bottom line. Where does it happen? Your compact bone, it happens a lot slower. It happens a lot quicker in spongy bone. So spongy bone has a lot of surface area. So those osteoclasts, like those scrubbing bubbles, they move on the surface. So spongy bone, they can easily eat away at that matrix. And in our bodies, where do we have spongy bone? Our vertebrae at the ends of our long bones. A broken hip, a broken vertebrae. You guys know what the most frequently broken bone is? What breaks a lot? Yeah, wrist a lot. Clavicles up there too. Your collarbone, your wrist. Two big ones. You lay it on your head. And the elderly, you see hip, um, 
vertebrae. Your femur rarely breaks unless you're in a car accident or something. All right. Um, so look at these stats. It's amazing. We're talking about millions of bone breaks a year. So osteoporosis is a huge public health issue. And women, half of the women over 50, oh my God, that's a shit. 50%. Look at you, half of you have that you're going to break a bone due to osteoporosis. Yeah. Men are less likely because of that hormonal difference. Like I said, estrogen, testosterone works differently on bones, and clearly the estrogen has a greater effect. So when that drops off, like menopause, women, you build up your bone density until like you're 30, and then it starts slowly going down. And so the thought is if you build it up early, when you guys are young and exercise, it takes longer for it to come down to we're gonna have a bone break. Um, and again, there are some drugs, you guys can, can look into that, that are helping. You would think you have more like, just have more um, calcium. It's not that simple though. Like eating more calcium. Yes, you want enough calcium, but you don't, you want, you don't store it as you think you would. So it's not as simple as I take calcium pills. Sure, they're going to go right through you. It doesn't mean your bone is going to be built. So it's more complex. There's no simple solution that we discovered, or else we'd have everyone in America on a certain kind of plan. Okay. So exercise, right. Nutrition, hormones are all involved in getting osteoporosis. And women more than men. And bones react to stimuli, of course. Like I said, you work out, they build up. You put them in a cast, they break down. And a big problem is our space travel. We have people in the space station with zero gravity. If they come down to Earth after being up there for a year, they would just collapse because they're, they're all their bones, they're not getting any, any uh, exercise. So we have treadmills, we have exercise, very important in space. Because if you're weightless, your bones are just going to deteriorate. All right, near the end here. A uh, little review here. What do you guys think? Bones, right? You think about protection. Protection, 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 because they're strong, protecting. You think about movements, the bones, the muscles attached to the bones across the joints, right? And then that's where you make your red blood cells, the white blood cells, all your blood. And then, as I mentioned, probably the first function of bone was to store minerals. We store them, we take them. Store them, we take them. When you're pregnant, the little fetus parasite sucks a lot of calcium out, and so women need to make sure they have enough calcium. All right, when you look at the numbers of bones, um, 206 is just an estimate. Here you look at someone has a neck rib, and here you have extra bones in the skull. Very, very common. And my lectures, uh, I'll record my lectures going through all the bones of the body. But uh, yeah, again, axial skeleton, down the axis. And um, we'll see these bones in lab, we've got skeletons. But you need to know that your skull, the highway bone is in your neck, Super cool. Your thoracic gauge and then your vertebrae is on the axis. Everything else is an appendix. I think it's the last slide. What do you guys think? Oh, yes. Oh, we're early. What am I going to do? All right. Any questions? All right. You are free to go.